Hi, guys. Hi. Well, hello. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for doing thanks, this. Patrick. Tell Hi. everybody else to put their masks on so you can take yours off. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate uh, you guys doing this. That was very nice. I was just, I was just I telling Patrick, I think this is like a treasure trove of how to run a bookstore through a crisis, kind of put it all together. And there's just so much information between all of you. What I've learned is that every day is a crisis, essentially, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or a challenge or a fight or you name it. And I do have to apologize for my appearance. I was just out in the heat because there was a crisis going on outside that I had to take care of. A uh, tractor trailer truck nipped one of our wires and tore down the whole wire. So I was trying to help cut that down with the landlord. So it's every day is a challenge. Every day is a new <laughs> new challenge that we have to figure out. So that's crazy. Yeah, it, it's it was crazy. It was a safety hazard, so we kind of had to nip it in the bud. <laughs> but um, <shh>. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's great. I appreciate you guys doing this. Uh, I've heard. Uh, actually from Karen and Larry that they had a really good time doing it so oh good wonderful we did <laughs> yeah well JT gets to launch us today uh, and, and, and so much better at it so if I screw it up she's gonna step in and do it but I'll, I'm gonna try it I'm gonna try it I'll try my big, best it's your big chance JT don't blow it I know right <laughs> don't it's your big break girl don't don't screw it up <laughs> no worries. well hello again we're back I'm JT Ellison, and this is Jane Ann Krentz. Jane, give a wave. We are back for another installation in our series, Behind the Pen, getting to know the amazing booksellers from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And today we're chatting with the honcho, the store manager, Bill oh, Smith. Are you, ready? are you ready for your grilling? I'll try my best. <laughs> I'll the and uh, other things like that. Barbara said to be honest, but, uh, you know, honest. <laughs> honest. <laughs> we take that with the greatest. By the end of this, <laughs> you're going to tell us everything. Right, right, right. You'll have my pin code and uh, <laughs> everything <laughs> up when I'm done. <laughs> so let's start with your social security number. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> take anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all in all seriousness, um, we've been really excited to talk to you. And Barbara has told us a lot, but we have a thousand questions. So so let's just kick it off sure, sure, sure. with how did you come to be a part of the pen? Oh yeah, yeah. So I've loved books all my life. Um, I started off uh, going to college and had to pay for my own way to get through it, and I couldn't afford it because it was some really expensive school. So what I did <laughs> was. I dropped out of school and started working for Borders back when Borders was a thing and uh, worked for them for quite a um, few years and uh, actually traveled across the country opening new stores for them. So I've had books in my blood for a long time. Um, also, uh, my mom is a kindergarten, was a kindergarten. I say is still because you never stop being a teacher, a <laughs> kindergarten teacher. Um, so I literally grew up with uh, Caldecott award-winning books you know on the kitchen table stuff like that so um i've always loved books um i was working for a big um uh, corporate company for a long time and um there was a uh, listing for part-time shipping help here so i actually started as a very very part-time shipper during the holiday season um and they kept me on and then i think i must have proved my grit or something like that and uh, Barbara took a chance and hired me to uh, lead the ship. So that's that's how it started. That's awesome. Yeah. So I have, to, I have to ask you, Barbara also says that you have, you said that, you, she said you've been through a trial by fire. She, I think she was referring to the, to the end, end of the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now whatever other side that we're on. Right. So. I have to ask, can you walk us through how the store survived? Because so many didn't. Yeah, so we were really lucky. Um, and I think lucky, but also smart. Um, and a lot of it has to really go to Barbara. Um, we kind of how I looked at it is like, our business was 80% um, in-store traffic. And this is pre-pandemic. 80% uh, in-store traffic and about 20% mail order. 
Um, and we had a robust uh, virtual programs and, and, and uh, author relationships. Um, so when the pandemic uh, occurred, essentially that 80-20 split and we went to 80% mail order and 20% in-store traffic because um, the reduction of people coming to the store. So we had to be quick and nimble to try to beef up our mail order system, get people in the right places, systems and stuff like that. Um, but uh, that was pretty much, you know, having that online presence kept us relevant kept us out there. Um, a lot of other places were trying to catch up to what we were already doing with all the virtual events um, and trying to have a mail order system. Actually, a lot of stores we heard were, didn't have even a mail order system at mm -hmm. all. Um, the, pers the, the company that we use for our POS system and our, our software essentially um, had to quickly set up a lot of their stores with mail order, how do we do this, you know, sort of thing for them to survive. Thankfully, we already had the infrastructure, if you want to call it that, in place. So we were able to transition that 80 to the other side um, so that we could survive and pretty much tread water. Um, we actually did pretty well during the pandemic because we had a lot of people who were home, wanted to read. So we gave them the materials to read. We gave them the stuff virtually to watch. So we kept them engaged. Um, and now we are, I will never say past the pandemic until I'm confident, um, but we're now sliding past it, sort of, um, where we are now trying to even that 80-20 out to a more even base or even equivalent um, and kind of focus more on our front end and also the mail order as well, bringing, mixing now in live events and not having all virtual events. But I can't tell you, we learned a lot of stuff. You know, now we can have authors from Iceland, for instance, was one of them. We had a very popular uh, program where we interviewed, and I forget, I apologize, I forget the author's name, but we had an author from Iceland. We have authors from Europe, from Australia, a lot of the times. So we were able to use our virtual capabilities to keep that going and offer that to our customers um, while other people didn't. And uh, I think honestly, that's really what um, helped us survive. And then also just our team is, you know, top mm -hmm. notch. Um, and of course, Barbara's our leader and, you know, she's tough as nails, you know, so she, she, you know, we take the risks, we took the risks and, um, you know, they paid off. So um, what she means by trial by fire is that I essentially started right before the pandemic. So it wasn't like I got to be sitting in my chair directing, like you would think a manager does. I was in the trenches, still am to this day. Um, in fact, I'm also sweaty because I've been helping out in shipping because we have somebody out with COVID. So um, everybody here isn't relegated to just their one job. Um, we all pitch in and nobody is above anyone else. And that's something that I firmly believe in. I don't believe, there's certain people that believe that managers shouldn't be doers or workers. Uh, I don't believe in that. I like to lead by example. Um, down there, putting boxes together, processing orders, running across the street, um, the breezeway to the store to, uh, you know, help with any sales or questions like that or shelving books. So that's honestly what I mean by team is that we have a standout group that um, is willing to do anything. You'll see Barbara taking out the trash. You'll see everybody doing anything. So whatever it takes, um, we do it. So, and it's because we love it. So. That's how we, that's I think what she's probably referring to because then we had the pandemic, um, then we had the bees. Uh, project. <laughs> you, should, you should explain the bees, probably it's people will know. Project. <laughs> project, project. Um, uh, I do curse like a sailor, so I'll try to try to um, rein it in. Yeah, so bees was uh, the Go Tell the Bees, the Diana Gabaldon book. Um, we learned a lot with that as well. We bit off more than we could chew um it took a lot more infrastructure than we had more people um the cost uh keeping track of it managing it was a nightmare um it was hard to be honest how many books were you dealing with that you had at uh, least thousand. how many Thirty thousand. wow so we didn't have storage space obviously a lot of, a lot of product to have so to move 
right? Yeah. We had to uh, quickly because we got, and again, unfortunately, a lot of things just kept coming up. Like we had to immediately find somewhere to house them. So we had to rent an offsite facility, um, hire a ton of offsite help. Um, figure out how to manage those people, how to techno technologically make it all work and come together. Um, and we weren't built for that. We're a store now of 10, 12 people maybe. Um, and we had a bunch more folks here. So it was, I don't want to use the word nightmare, but it was, it was very, uh, it was hard to get through. Um, it was mentally taxing, physically taxing. Um, it's hard to talk about, honestly, sometimes because I'm just being honest because it was it was a really hard time, but uh, we got through it. We're at the tail end of it. Uh, we're just cleaning up uh, some of the the remnants or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, again, we've learned um, what we can handle, what we can't, um, you know, things like that. So that was you know COVID, then bees, and now we're here. Um, and so I guess that's probably what she means by um, trial by fire. I, you know, there was a long period of time where I was shipping so much she's like I don't think you're a manager and I'm like well I'm not really right now I'm a shipper <laughs> you know sort of thing so <laughs> it was uh but again that just goes back to you know you got to do what you got to do and um we want this place to keep going for another 30 years so uh, whatever it takes to do it we'll do it sort of thing so. well, a, a lesser store and a lesser team would have collapsed under that weight <laughs> yeah well it was yeah it was a trying time and uh it's Fortunately, something I can't really make light of because uh, it, it, it hurt in a lot of ways, but uh, we got through it. So I'm proud of that. Well, and I got my copy. So <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. As long as mine came, I'm not <laughs> worried about the other 29,999 right. of them. I learned a lot about people, frankly. Uh, <laughs> oh, I bet. Obsessive, I bet. obsessive fans, uh, customer service. Um, uh, <laughs> I learned a lot about people, and that's just code for. I think you understand what I'm saying. Oh. <laughs> um, putting, putting that aside, what's the actual, in, just in the mail order business, that side of things, what's the logistics? What does it take from the person who gets in touch and wants to order a book to get it out the door in the mail? Yeah, yeah. So we have a system where it comes in through email and then um, automatically goes into our POS system. We have a mail order manager who then processes the work. And, it, and of course, when it was a bees project, we had a bunch of people doing that. So you run into issues where there's too many cooks in the kitchen sort of thing. And so now we're at the point where we have one manager who's really sharp and he's really nailing it. So he will process them. The paperwork comes out and this is overly simplified. Um, we marry the paperwork up with the book. The book goes to shipping. Um, the books are mylar if they're hardcover. Um, and then they get wrapped up, boxed up. Um, then shipping is applied to it. And then the USPS uh, primarily then comes and picks it up. Uh, but there's a ton of things that could go wrong or things that don't go cleanly from A to B to C. Um, we obviously have a lot of signed books. So we have to, one of the things with the pandemic and our um, authors not touring as much, what we had to do was take the books from uh, the warehouse. Instead of coming directly to us, we send them to their residents. Um, they would sign them and then ship them to us. And so it added, a, yeah, you know, so it add another leg to uh, the steps, which then elongates the process. Also, unfortunately, adds way more opportunity for damage, which I don't think people think about a lot because mm -hmm. you're not just going from the warehouse to us, you're going warehouse residence then to us. And unfortunately, not everybody's careful about packing, even the people from the warehouse. So we got a lot of damage that we'd have to account for. Um, the other thing that I guess, customers and other people don't really take into account is that that then elongates the time it will take for them to actually get the book. They think that because we live in an Amazon world that everything, once the release date hits, it, sh it shouldn't be shipping. It should be at their door. Mm -hmm. So that was the other challenge that we have is to try to temper those expectations to that we not only have extra time to get it signed, but then we have to get it back, process it, mylar it, get it shipped with a very minimal staff and then out to the customer. So um, those are the, you know, some of the kind of the mail order challenges that we dealt with and deal with to this day. Um, but it's pretty great to have this network of authors that will be so receptive to getting 
um, cases of books at their front door, um, you know, and, you know, them emailing me like I need a label so I can send them back. I'm like, all right, I got you. Let's go. Um, and um, so it's pretty great that we have that kind of group of authors that are willing to promote their books, but also keep us afloat and keep us relevant um, and give us that kind of edge that we, we need to survive. Um, that's what I tell a lot of people is that um, they may think it's a romantic thing to have a bookstore, to manage a bookstore and to work in a bookstore. And to some degree it is, but every day is a challenge. Um, independent bookstores, you're fighting tooth and nail, no joke, every day to meet your goals just to survive. Payroll, electric, you name it. Um, so that's what's really difficult is that it's taxing on you. It, it can wear you down. Um, but How if you hours a week do you work? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> but not, not as many as uh, Barbara. <laughs> Barbara is, I don't think, human. She's a machine. Um, that lady yeah, impresses me every day. I don't know how she does it. I go home at night and I feel guilty because I know she's putting in way more hours and harder stuff than we are. So it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. But um, yeah, um, by the time Friday hits, I'm, I'm ready to, to go to bed. <laughs> but, uh, but again, it's worth doing because I love the people here um, and I love the business. I love everything about the books. I come from a graphic design background. So one of my favorite things is actually unboxing the books and seeing the covers. You're not supposed to judge a book by the cover, but I do. I'm in love with fonts. I love all the artwork. I just, I adore it. It's one of my favorite things is to open up something and see a book where someone has taken the time to actually do a good design. And that just makes my heart bigger. And so I, I love that stuff. So it makes it really worth it, so. I, I gotta tell you, I saw that on the website and I, I got all excited because you're probably the only other person in the world that will appreciate this story. <laughs> we were in Italy on vacation. We were in Saluzzo and I'm walking down the street. And it's just this gorgeous little town, right? It's just quintessential Northern Italian town. Yeah. And here's a, a historical marker for Gian, uh, Gian Battista Badoni. This is where he's from. This is yeah. his home. And I'm like, what? That's one of my favorite gods. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like fangirling over this sign. And my whole family's looking at me like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you see my shelf at home. I have books upon books of fonts. Um, again, coming from a graphic What's design background. Font? What's that? What's your favorite font? It's, it's hard. Um, it's a very boring font, but I absolutely adore it. Helvetica. Uh, well, there's nothing boring about Helvetica. There's a, it's if you ever get a chance, check out the documentary uh, called Helvetica. It is fantastic. It shows both sides where some people, you know, they, they term it a pedestrian font that, you know, lazy designers use just because it's easy. It's like the aerial, the universal, all those fonts. But then there's the other side where they go into the history of it and they're like, no, this is an elegant font. And so I'm on that side. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I can't drive down the road without looking at posters and billboards and stuff and you're like, what were you thinking? Or, you know, oh, that's excellent. You know, good job sort of thing like that. And, um, I just love design. It's just one of my favorite things. So, but uh, yeah, fonts are great. <laughs> Have you seen any cool covers recently that just really stood out to you? Oh, Jeepers Creepers. Um, not that I can give an example for, but I will say I just unpacked today's shipment and I couldn't think of any, but I'm uh, at least daily, those are probably two or three that I really like. Um, and <laughs> Of course, I'm the ding dong that's like, hey, hey, look, look, look at this one. Isn't this cool? And everyone's probably like, okay, that's okay. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> what is that's wrong with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, I just, you know, I love, I love that. I just really do. I think it's, it's one of the greatest things. And uh, I, for me, I think it's a missed opportunity if no one takes advantage of that because you have an audience. Someone's going to be reading your book. I used to take the slip covers off the book when I would be reading them because I'm one of those people that, uh, reads the book like try not to crack it you know sort okay. of thing like that yeah uh, so when people dog ear books like my wife does I just oh well come on it just drives me crazy because I just cherish them so much I guess um and I always have you know even when I wasn't in school and I was working for borders um 
I was dating a girl in Boston College. She was going there for school. So I'd drive down. I lived in Maine at the time. So I'd drive the four hours down to visit her. And I'd spend a lot of time on my own because I'd wait for her to get out of school and stuff. And what I would do is go to their, um, their uh, bookstore and they posted all of the, uh, uh, the, the books that are for each class, the syllabuses or whatever syllabi. And I would just go get the books and read along with them, even though I wasn't taking their classes, just for giggles, you know, just to kind of keep up and see what the other, you know, people in the educational system were doing so I could kind of stay current, I guess. Um, and I did a lot, actually a lot of learning, self-learning that way. I just read, 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 three or four books at a time. Um, when I worked for Borders, they required you to read at least one or two a week. Um, so that you could offer recommendations to folks as they came in. And, and it was nice. I mean, back then I had the time to do it. Now um, I don't read as much. I actually listen um, because I have a half an hour to work and a half an hour home. And then any downtime, if I'm out puttering around in the garden or doing anything, I pop my earbuds in and uh, I listen to a ton of audiobooks. Um, it's for me, I still not the same as reading a book but at least I get the content um, mm -hmm. and the enjoyability of it uh, or enjoyment uh, from it um, so that's how I get my media now essentially in terms of books I, it's a lot of audio books and stuff so well don't leave it there what do you listen to what? oh yeah <laughs> well, I, just, I, I gotta pull out my phone um, I just finished up Sapiens I don't know if you guys have read that mm -hmm. one. I actually have it I haven't read really, it but really enjoyed that one i'm re-listening to the cormac mccarthy ones because i cannot wait for his new releases coming out in october and december he's one of my favorites um george saunders latest one uh really enjoyed that tom jones not the singer um <laughs> he wrote pugilist at rest i really really like his stuff um let me see what else i got uh, oh stuff like that um uh some stuff i don't even want to mention <laughs> i get into these tangents and it's strange i am not an athletic guy as you can probably tell um but i was taken by the recent um series on hbo that was all about the la lakers and so oh my god it was incredible i, I get obsessed I, guess, I kind of get it yes absolutely i get terrible obsessed but by, incredible <laughs> yeah it was it was but it was super enjoyable. So I ended up reading West on West, his biography, uh, two Kareem Abdul-Jabbar biographies. So I get like on these obsessive tangents. And um, so after watching that show, I was like watching YouTube videos of basketball, uh, <laughs> you know, reading as much as I could about them and stuff. And uh, so, yeah, it's like, it may not be what is normal for me or whatever, but I, I get on these tangents where I'm just like, oh yeah, that's really interesting. It doesn't matter the subject matter. As long as this is, it's engaging, well-written, it's worth, and it's worth your time, then I say, go for it. Don't, I guess I've learned that a lot with music too, which is another thing I'm, I'm very obsessed with is that um, for the longest time, I was a snooty, snooty snob at the record store. I worked at record stores when I was younger. I was the guy that was, in the like in the movie um i forget the one the, uh, yes thank you great book <laughs> but i was that guy I, you were <laughs> I was that guy and would make fun of people for getting the lionel richie or whatever it was well it wasn't until i turned 40 that i was like you know what why am i limiting myself i listen to absolutely everything now um heavy into gangster rap uh love pop music i'll listen to country music i'll listen to everything now because i really changed my thinking on that. And I believe that with books too, is that why limit yourself because it's cool or you think that that fits what your genre vein or whatever it is, check out other stuff. It's totally, you're limiting yourself. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you explore everything, you know, that you have the ability to look at? So, um, so that's why I'm really open to anything, you know, like the, the latest, um, I'm not the latest, the Thomas Perry book, The Old Man, um, is a show on TV that I'm really enjoying. So I was like, hey, I'll just start reading that. And I was like, that's the guy who's been in our store a bunch of times. That's funny, you know? Um, so it's it's kind of cool to have those links and associations and stuff like that. So if anyone gets anything out of this, I want them to never limit themselves because you think it's cool 
or because you think it's what you need to do or should do, open yourself to everything. Read as much, be voracious as use that word often, use voracious and just read everything. If you don't like it, so be it. If you love it, there you go. Recommend it to someone else, but never limit yourself. I, that's really the one big takeaway from getting older um, that I've learned is that you do a disservice to yourself by being cool, you know? So words to that, live. I'm definitely not live. cool. <laughs> so. Join the uncool kids. That's right. I've never that's, been that cool. should be our, we should start a gang, the uncool kids. I'll get satin jackets. We'll put some embroidery on the back. You know. <laughs> Well, well that, that's a, the satin jacket I could go for. I like anything yeah. glittery. Um, yeah. But that leads us to an interesting question because you've been in the business long enough to see some trends, changes. If you look back, where what kind of subgenres have have you seen go ebb and flow? Um, yeah. So primarily here, we started out as a, uh, I'm sure everyone knows, as a murder mystery store. And um, what we have noticed is the, bless you, what we've noticed is that the, um, the real category jumps that we've seen is um, teen, young adult, and uh, sci-fi for us um, mm -hmm. has really grown. Um, so we're actually actively, instead of being complacent, which is a, it's death if you're complacent, if you aren't continually changing, trying to keep up with what's going on, being current, you're gonna die. Um, so what we're trying to do is look at what categories are growing and try to expand those and contract where we're less popular or whatever you want to call it. Um, and those are the categories that we've re really seen grow. Maybe the advent of Harry Potter has really caused the YA category to, Joe, uh, to jump um, with adults and kids. Um, but I honestly, I don't care what they're reading as long as they're reading. Uh, I was really happy to see that people really picked up reading more than they had. And if it's because of Harry Potter, so be it. I just want people to read. But those are the categories that we've seen really grow. So our challenge is that we have a very limited space here. So trying to figure out how to grow those physically in size is always a challenge uh, with shelving, uh, you know, trying to turn over books, um, returning books that aren't selling um, or, are pop or aren't as popular, but still trying to maintain a base so those are kind of our challenges as well. But those categories are, are, are the ones that we've noticed that are really growing. Um, and I'm happy that that's the case. Um, you know, we've got a, uh, a pretty good nonfiction section and I'd love to try to keep trying to grow that more and more because honestly, that's the stuff I enjoy reading probably more than anything um, is the nonfiction stuff. And again, if it's a good story, it's a good story, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the areas that we've seen grow, for sure. So if you if you look at the subgenres within those areas, um, take the standard suspense genre. We we the three of us, Barbara and JT and I, have discussed a, a lot about the gothic novel and, and and the new gothic, trying to define it, you know, and watch it come up. Right. Um, and then we watch psychological suspense become a big thing in the past few years. Right. Um, a lot of true crime. I think oh, the, yeah. I've seen a lot of jump of true, true crime and I'm guessing, but I think a lot of it has to do with podcasts jumped mm. popularity. And this is just my guess, but I know podcasts have really grown exponentially within the last four or five years or whatever you want to call it. Um, and a lot of those are focused on true crime, suspense, murder, um, sibling murder, all these different subgenres, genres um, but also there's show upon show upon show on television too that is dedicated to snapped or my sibling murdered my mom or sort of thing. There's all of these shows that they're on TV too. So I think other media outlets or media areas feed these book subgenres as well because we've seen like a lot of true crime, which again was that's our bread and butter. Um, you know, we've seen big jumps with that um, and, and become popular for other people. Uh, but I, I think honestly, a lot of it is driven by other media outlets or means or whatever you like to call it. But um, it's always I mean, good to see. Makes sense. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, in, in my genre with romantic suspense, I've certainly seen that, you know. Yeah. yeah. JT, you're, you're straight up suspense. What, 
what do you see coming in from the oh i mean gothic is still i was looking today at a new book that is a, truly a gothic i mean the gothic and they're they're edging more into horror right so it's it's like the hacienda they're edging away from the unreliable narrator gothic into the straight up this is horror yeah and and so that seems to be having a, a bit of a resurgence and i'm wondering if all the true crime podcasts, people are a little less afraid of darker books. Yeah. So yeah. I feel like the books are getting darker again. They had lightened up for a while and they're getting darker again. Taking risks, you know, and and yeah. And diving into those things that they maybe it's okay now that we can read about these things. Maybe that's what they're thinking, you know. Uh, I think a lot of that really has to do with that. Um, that now there are those authors that are tapping into those veins that it used to be maybe something that was such a subgenre, such a niche uh, mm -hmm. vein or whatever you want to call it. Now it's more popular and they're like, oh, okay. More authors are coming out and be like, oh, this is acceptable. I can, you know, more and more authors will bring their books to the table, if you want to call it that, um, because they see, oh, yes, people are interested in these different things and bringing more of the gothic, more of the horror, more of that stuff into the bookstores and people's hands. Um, which again, I keep going back to, Hey, if you're reading, I'm happy. You know, sure. That's what we well, want. it's, you know, so is, so is that going to be Jane? I guess this is a side conversation that we should probably have, but is the, has the Gothic turned into what vampires was 20 years ago? <laughs> you know, it, what Anne Rice was doing with vampires. Is that what the Gothic is doing now? It, it, you know, Oh, obviously you and me and Barbara need a, a, <laughs> a side chat. That's, <laughs> Hmm, that's really interesting. And I'd be curious what would be maybe what tips off it fading away or staying strong. You know, what, right. are, what are the things that cause these trends to happen? I mean, we can kind of look at like a Harry Potter, a Twilight or a other things like that. But um, yeah, I, I'm very curious. I'd love to see what these title shifts, you know, how they occur and, and it kind of examine them. It'd be kind of neat to, to see that. I think sometimes it's as simple as a fresh landscape yeah. because underneath the stories, the core stories don't change much. Yeah. You know, the genres don't change much, but they look so much fresher and newer and more startling and exciting if they're against a landscape you're not familiar with. And I mean, like, um, like the horror landscape, we haven't seen that for a long time right. um, or uh, the futuristic landscape or the psychic landscape or the moon you know i mean just something that makes the mystery look different because of the i don't know what the world that it's set in but this underlying mystery is or whatever is the romance whatever the genre you're working with is still is still the core of the story yeah and and our our folks downstairs um and i say downstairs because we're recording upstairs um uh have to stay on their toes too when recommending books because some of those subgenres, like the horror genre, there's folks that are completely turned off by that, um, mm -hmm. do not like that sort of thing. There's other um, things in books that people are very sensitive to. Um, so you always have to be careful. Um, you could have kids come in too. Um, you just have to be careful with what you recommend. So having a very literate group is necessary, very necessary to kind of guide people. Because we still to this day, and, and this has always been the case, People come in, I don't know what I want. I like this, this, and this. Tell me, help mm -hmm. me. Oh, yeah. You know, show me what you think I want. It's like you have to do a lot of mind reading, but like Patrick is a genius at it. That guy is amazing to watch when he sells books because he can tap into what they're looking for and then kind of customize his recommendation. And it's phenomenal to watch because he's such a good, you know, he's very, very good at it. But you have to be very careful with what you recommend because you could completely turn someone off um, or just give them something that they're like, oh, this is garbage, you know. And again, that's another challenge that Barbara has that I have a lot of respect for because we have all these book clubs and every month she has to go through and pick books that fit these specific book clubs. And they may not always be the cup of tea for whoever the people are, you know, and so she takes that risk, you know, this one may have a little more sex in this one, a little more violence in this one, or, you know, or just be a book that people don't like. So it's a big risk and that's a hard job, you know, again, more respect for her for 
for forging forward and trying to figure out those um, books to recommend to people. So, well, that's a good opportunity to tell us how the book clubs work within the yeah. store. Again, thinking that other bookstores might be looking at this and wondering how do I make that work. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, we have uh, Karen, who I think has been on this as well. Um, she really enjoyed her interview. She heads up our book clubs. Um, essentially, people email into her to sign up, and th there becomes a list. And then every month, what do, what happens is Barbara picks the book, um, and then Karen is then responsible for um, compiling all the paperwork, processing the books, and we ship them out. We have special bookmarks that signify that you know this is a July um, true or a fantastic fiction selection. So they get a special bookmark that we designed in house just to um, kind of signify that that's a book club book and they know what, why they're getting it. There's a lot of gifts too that that helps kind of identify what the book is for because people give gifts to other people and they don't want the paperwork in there with the price and all that stuff. But essentially people just email in, um, they get added to the list. And then um, when the picks come out monthly, uh, we send them their book and it's pretty- well, You mean people like would buy, a, a, buy the book club for a friend or a relative yes. as a gift? Yep. Got it, yep. okay. Yep. yep, sorry if I wasn't clear. No, but that, that's perfect, that makes yeah, sense. It's, yeah. it's pretty great too. And it's, it's wonderful to see uh, the, the titles come through um, and see people that are happy with the selections and stuff like that. It's pretty neat to see. So just another opportunity to kind of get our suggestions out there um, and to try to engage more too as well. We just started a more recent one, um, actually starting in July. It's a romance um, book club that's specific to romance and relationships is the, the title of it. Um, that actually is another genre that we have seen grow exponentially as well along with the YA and sci-fi is romance is a big category for us John Charles one of our wonderful mm -hmm. booksellers does a heck of a job um, not only curating it but keeping it going engaging the authors um, that guy is stand up he's wonderful at his job I can't tell you I wouldn't want anyone else doing it frankly um, so we're starting that new book club this month and I'll be very interested to see if it takes off and I hope it does because there's a need for it out there. So I'm hoping that we can provide that for folks. Um, so they'll get a monthly book and um, hopefully some pleasure out of it. So that that's such a great segue because Poison Pen used to be a mystery bookstore. Right. And now you guys cover the gamut. You've got book clubs, you've got newsletters, everything from all different genres because you've brought in a group of people Right. who specialize in different things. And I think that's what's making the store such a rich ground for us to talk to you about because, you know, we've got a little something for everyone right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got a guy that, uh, PK, who runs the sci-fi section. He's really dialed in. Um, you know, we've got individuals here that just, they know their stuff. They stay mm -hmm. current with it. So they're not only able to help make recommendations, but also help with ordering to understand what do we order? What is the new hot thing? What is something that we think would be enjoyable for our audience to see or read. Um, so having that, again, it kind of goes back to what I was saying is that you can't be complacent. You can't just stay with what you think is the right thing. Um, you have to keep trying to take those risks. You have to have those specialties, those real captains of those genres that will be able to guide us through. Um, I can't know everything. Patrick doesn't know everything. So to have those people out there to support, to help us understand where the market is, what people want to see is, is a huge thing. So again, it just goes back to having an awesome team. So I can't say it enough. We wouldn't be here without our group of people. There's no way. And, and think, that, that, I'm sorry, Jane. I didn't mean to no, I was just going to say that's one of the things people look to in an independent bookstore is the curating, the, yeah. you know, the recommendations and the curating and, right. um, that's we're, not, we're not a Costco that just have stacks upon stacks of books. We have people that actually read them, uh, care about them. Um, that's the cool thing is when someone actually cares about the stuff. You go to a store, I don't care what it is. If you have somebody that actually cares about what they're doing, it shows. And if it doesn't, you know, you go in and someone's flat and they're just like, you know, put off or whatever. If they don't <laughs> care about what they're doing, it's it's a miserable experience and it's not worth it, you know, so the fact that we have a group here that really cares and has stuck with it, um, 
it's pretty awesome. And that was that was what I was going to ask. Is that is that what gives you the leg up over the chains in the big box? That's what keeps us relevant. You you've been there. You've been on both sides of the fence now. I mean, how how different is book selling from a chain store to an indie store? Oh, it's very different. Very very different. A lot more resources with the chain. Never had to worry about payroll. Never had to worry about keeping the lights on. Um, you know, it was it was a behemoth at the time. It was Barnes and Noble versus Borders. Mm -hmm. that, that was the fight, you know, um, you never had to worry about those things. You didn't worry about, you know, making the daily sales and stuff like that. At least the level I was at, I'm sure the GM and stuff did, but they were such a huge presence in the country that, you know, they, if one store was failing or, or not making what they needed to, it was absorbed into the big, the bigger picture. We're on our own. We're in this big ocean and we're just floating along you know, trying to make our way and survive. And I'm not joking. Every month is a challenge. And, um, you know, if you're not worth, if you're not up for the fight, then you're going to have to leave because it's, it's, it is a challenge and, you know, and it, it's a good one. So um, not having borders around is good. Uh, it'd be nice. If, <laughs> it'd be nice if Barnes and Noble went that way as well. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and again, no ill will toward them because I, I came from there too. So, um, but you know, you don't get the same experience as you would at an independent bookstore. When I travel, I search out bookstores, uh, like even just going to Tucson, I'll, I'll go down to their bookstores. Uh, we traveled to Portland, um, in January of this year, uh, Portland, Oregon. And, you know, we tried to go to as many stores as we could, obviously Powell's, um, things like that. So it's always, you're always searching out, at least I am, you know, and I know a lot of people here is that. You're always looking to see, you know, see what do you guys do? What are you guys doing? You know, what, how do you have your, your stuff set up? And, you know, it, it's kind of neat to see. And it's always this, you have this like unspoken camaraderie, honestly, uh, when you go to another independent bookstore, um, you may not say it, but I feel it sometimes. I get goosebumps thinking about it because, you know, looking at that person behind the counter, even if you're a customer, you're like, you know what they're going through, mm -hmm. you know, the challenges that they're going through. So it's like, you get that kind of, I don't know what the word would be, but a, a sort of bond, an unspoken bond that you have um, because collectively independent bookstores are all in the same fight. Um, and it's hard not to have respect for folks that are putting everything into it, you know, families, um, you know, everything. They're just throwing everything at it to try to stay relevant, stay open um, and stuff like that. You have to applaud that and uh, respect it. And uh, so I always try to pick up a book here or there um, just to support them. But um, it's pretty awesome to see. I want to see more open and less closed, frankly. Well, that's, let's circle back for a second because you're the first person I think that we've spoken to in this series who brought up audio books. Yeah. How, and, and I know the answer to this, but how can our viewers, your viewers, your people find audio books in an independent bookstore? Uh, what's great is that we actually have a program. Uh, it's Libro.fm is a company that uh, does audiobooks. And what's great about that is that when customers sign up for that program and get their audiobooks through that service, we actually get a, a percentage of the cut from that, um, which is pretty great. Um, and then what's also great is that um, you know how they have ARCs that are physical books. Well, mm -hmm. they have ALCs, which are audio or advanced listening copies. So because we're booksellers, they provide us access to all of these books on tape, not tape, but you know what I mean, um, that we can actually <laughs> listen to for free, which is great to give us the ability to be able to recommend the books. But uh, yeah, Libro.fm is the, um, the partner that we have. And I think it, they partner up with a lot of independent bookstores where um, if anyone does sign up for that, we actually get a little percentage of the take or whatever you want to call it. Um, which is pretty fantastic. So we don't necessarily take it away. Uh, it's not taking away our business or anything like that. It's more supplementing it. Um, so it's pretty great. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's very cool. One of the things I've always enjoyed most about the store is that book news, you know, the right. monthly update on what's coming out. And right. JT and I both have said we order from it. You know, that's our 
shopping. <laughs> You're not the only one. I, I see a lot of the sales emails come in and I can always tell when one's sent out, even before it hits my inbox, I start getting ding, 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 all these orders coming. <laughs> so you're not the only one. People actually, it's like a shopping list, essentially. Um, we have a lot of people that rely on it um, to see what's new, what's upcoming. Um, and that's, again, another thing that Barbara does. And she has a support crew that helps her that it, there's no way we could do it. And she does a great job putting it out there. And um, it provides that service for folks to be what's on the radar, what's new, what's hot, what, you know, little descriptions, um, you know, things like that. And it's, it's a huge, huge help for our sales, honestly. Um, and then just getting awareness out there of what's upcoming, what, you know, who's stopping by the store for an event or what's the virtual program tomorrow night or, you know, all of these different things or, you know, it's just, it's pretty great. And, uh, you know, we live in a uh, culture now where, if you email someone, you're probably emailing a machine or you're talking to someone that is uh, a robot or in a different country or whatever, which is fine. Um, but here you talk to me <laughs> or you, when you email me, it doesn't go to like some, some weird you're place. Not a bot. It comes to me. <laughs> and uh, so there's actually, what's kind of neat is that there's actually people on the other end here that are, are helping out, which is great again, because we can provide that special touch, that little extra mile, you know, uh, research for folks, um, you know, asking when something's come out or, hey, I know the name of this character. Can you help me understand what book that might be in? Things like questions like that. You know, you may not get a response from a Barnes and Noble or a Borders back in the day or Am definitely not Amazon. Um, but here you will get someone who responds back personally because we're people and we're not, you know, a fulfillment center. Uh, so we are a fulfillment center, but not in that regard, if that makes sense. <laughs> Um, we're you're a very bespoke, you're yeah. a very bespoke fulfillment center. <laughs> yes. So, um, so that's the difference, you know, and that, and that's again, which makes me love my job is that we have that personal touch. We have the ability to guide people, show them what we think is the right thing or what they might like, or all these different things. And it's pretty great to have that opportunity. And I don't take it lightly, honestly, because, you know, it's important. You know, you can't just be like, oh, we'll just give them the, the bestseller list is over there. Uh, the New York Times bestseller list, just give them the latest one there. No, we want, and that's again, another thing that Patrick does an amazing job at. He's dialed in and he knows what, he has this ability to be able to provide these recommendations that people are so happy with, that they come back. And we have a staff selection section again, and we have folks that actually immediately go to that to see, okay, what is Patrick like? What is Barbara like? What is Bill like? What is Ian, Sharon, Karen, all these different people? Because they've learned that like, oh, I do like what Patrick, I like his stuff. So I'll always go see what is on his shelf. Or Karen's really got, you know, she's really into these Nordic authors and, you know, oh, here's the latest one, the Poby that she's really into or whatever. Um, so it's cool to see people that gravitate toward different employees selections it's kind of neat to see it because you can kind of curate in a different way what people may want to buy and, and people search it out so it's pretty neat and i know that's something i always look at when i go to other bookstores i always go to their staff selection to see um you know like what are you guys into or you know oh i saw that that's that's a crappy book what are you talking about <laughs> Why is that a <laughs> you know i was like what are you thinking but no it's it's, it's one of the again one of those personal things that you know it's not an algorithm, you know, Amazon is, you know, your phone's listening to you and Amazon's listening to you and all these things, your television's listening to you to try to give you these media uh, recommendations. Well, we actually are the people here that are live and, and not robots and not a, a mathematical uh, equation that's trying to feed you what will make them the most money. I can't tell you, and, and Barbara, close your ears. There's been times where I would rather people leave without anything than to get the wrong book. I said on more than one occasion, I would rather you get what you want and need than for me to sell you garbage. And if we lose a sale, we lose a sale, but we'll win a person or a customer and some dedication and loyalty. Um, and that's honestly what keeps us going is our loyalty, our dedication of our customers to us. You know, we do our part and they do theirs too. And uh, when you have a pretty decent, solid base like that, 
you do get the ability to hang around for 32 years and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, keep up the fight, if that makes sense. Because every day is a fight. So. Well, here's to 32 more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so. Yeah, we're going to do it too. And, and uh, I'm confident in that. Um, you know, I don't want to see this ever stop, frankly. I, 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 I'm stubborn as, you know, I'm a New Englander at heart. Uh, that's where I grew up. So I have this built in, you tell me what to do. I'm going to do the opposite because I, I <laughs> contrarian. Yeah, absolutely. If I, even if I don't agree with it, I'm still going, yeah, I'm sharing how you know, sort of thing. And, you know, I learned a lot of that from my dad who still holds grudges of the revolutionary war. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's built into my DNA that I'm going to be that tough old bird. That's not going to give up. And, uh, you know, a lot of that's in Barbara's DNA. Patrick's DNA that uh, we're not going to lay down for anybody, really. Uh, they're going to have to drag us out of here. So we're going to do our best to make that not happen. Before we before we get to the ending zone, have you had any problem with people coming in and telling you what you should and should not have on your shelves? Have you seen any signs of this, this growing censorship? Gaming. Not too bad. Um, I do get a lot of the emails, um, a lot of feedback via email, um, and we just ignore it. Um, you know, everyone has their opinion. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about banned books. There's a lot of talk about, hey, even our mask policy for a long time, people were up in arms about it. Um, so, you know, we're in a very red state. Uh, we have a pocket of blue in Phoenix. Um, but we're in a very, you know, it's, it's not everybody thinks the same way we do. And uh, so we try to stay as neutral as possible. Um, because again, I want you to read and I want to be a service. I don't want to shut anyone out, frankly. Um, but we do get a lot of feedback and we just, you know, read it, accept it um, and move forward uh, with what decisions we think are best and what we should carry. Um, I do not believe in censorship. I do not believe in banning books. I do not believe on in muzzling anyone's ability to put anything out there. And that's that's my I live and die by that. Um, Amen. Even that being introduced into our schools makes me sick to my stomach. Um, you know, Beverly clearly Cleary should never be a person that's censored. Um, you know, all of those. Jude books. Bloom. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. So, you know, we fight that and we do our best to stay neutral, but we also will not, we're not going to bend down to anyone or bend over or whatever the word would be, or um, we're just not going to be those people. We're going to provide what we can to everybody. And again, like I keep saying, as long as you're reading, I'm happy. So. Yay. <laughs> yeah, big yay. Yeah. Oh big my gosh, yay. Bill, this, this has been Absolutely. I'm so nervous too. You guys are so easy to talk to. I apologize. <laughs> well, yeah, we're just, a, we're just a bunch of book people, a bunch of book nerds having a yeah. chat. <laughs> Again, we have to start that gang with the satin and on the back of our book nerds, you know, and, you know, we can go down the street, you know. You I know. want the jacket. I want the jacket for sure. Yeah, I think it's well, great. You're a nerd. You're a nerd. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We could get our, you know, our gang colors all set up, you know, and I'll design, I'll design it with a font that we all appreciate. <laughs> it, it has to be Bodoni. It has to be Bodoni. Come on. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of Bodoni. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll do Bodoni with a little Helvetica. And Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds great. No, I, I appreciate your time too. It's been, it's been wonderful to get to know you guys a little bit better. You, oh, thanks. Ooh. Thanks. So I think, I, I'm not sure if we're like done, done, but I think we're wrapped for now. And I've heard that this is going to become a series that you can listen to all of these or watch all of these at once. So they're all collected together. So I know Great. that is to come and we'll have links, uh, you know, the store will have links and Jane and I will have it on our social media and we'll share it widely. And, you know, I, I've got to say, this has been so much fun. And thank you to Barbara and all of you for letting us pull back the, the veil and yeah. see what really goes on at a bookstore. I think, I know I have a much broader view of what you all are doing and a lot of respect for what you all are doing. Well, I, I also wanna say thank you to you guys because again, it's like what you said, um, not to ape what you're saying, but it is pulling back the curtain. Um, I think people hopefully appreciate uh, independent bookstores in general more um, and appreciate what it goes to make it happen. 
um, what it goes into making the lights stay on, the doors stay open, and uh, the books to be out there for them to choose from. I think this is great. Anything that we can do to shine a light on that is what we want. So this is, I appreciate you guys very, very much. Oh, we were, we were thrilled to do it. It's been educational and it's been fun. And like I said, when this is all put together, I yeah. think it's going to be a perfect little masterclass. In, in, yeah, a TED in talk. Book for <laughs> yeah. sure. Welcome to my TED talk. In bookstores. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks a million. Yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.